Hey, everyone. Welcome back to your favorite sales podcast. I'm your host, Ross Rich, and we have a very, very special guest for you today. We have Kyle Coleman, who is the CMO of Copy AI. You might know him from some of his previous endeavors as well. And yeah, thanks so much, uh, Kyle, for joining us today. My pleasure, Ross. I'm so excited to be here. I got two varies, a very, very special guest. Yes. That's exciting. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you can live up to it. I know, uh, yeah, we're setting expectations very high. Uh, so maybe before we dive in, and we're going to talk about some, uh, some things that are very near and dear to my heart in terms of points of view, which I always conflate with, um, you know, conviction and having, uh, you know, something unique to bring to conversations with customers, which I think is incredibly important for sales conversations. But before we get into that, we'd love for you to maybe kind of, you know, share a bit of your background and how you ended up as the CMO at, uh, at Copy AI. Yeah, I'll, I'll give the short version because I don't want to bore people to tears here. I was the sixth employee at a company called Looker, business intelligence company back in 2013, grew the SDR team to about 70 people or so. The company itself grew to 110 million in revenue, acquired by Google for two and a half billion in 2019. Same year, I jumped over to Clary, 10x revenue over the next five years, leading SDR, demand gen enablement, and then ultimately became the CMO at Clary. And now I've been at Copy AI for about six months and series A, super small, but extremely promising startup in the generative AI space, solving, uh, really eliminating this problem of go-to-market bloat that exists at all of these different companies that got fat and happy over the uh, the boom years in SaaS in particular. So helping companies right-size that with, with AI. Yeah, super interesting um, journey from, you know, early stages at Looker to building out SDR teams to then doing you know something similar at Clary, which is you know a great go-to-market technology company, and now CMO. I don't think that's uh, as common of a path, and still closing deals. Um, you know, obviously doing everything in an early stage company. What was what was the jump like from you know leading um, you know demand gen teams to uh, you know by the the one to one hand combat to yeah. more of the kind of broader CMO path. Yeah, well, no executive is great at everything. So let's be clear about that. I'm not great at all of the things. I hire much more capable people around me to fill in the gaps. But my, I got very lucky because my first, my first four years at Looker, I reported directly to the CMO and worked mm. hand in hand with our VP of demand gen, a gal named Lisa Daniels, who was the best in the business. So I learned what great looks like on the demand side. My last two years at Looker, I reported directly to the CRO and worked very closely with the VPs of sales and the regional directors and all the rest. Again, best mm. in the business, great go-to-market shop there. And so I got a really good sense of what it's like on both sides of the house. And mm -hmm. then at Clary, because I worked so closely with Lisa on the demand side at Looker, I was able to take that on when the gap presented itself at Clary and just like, I know what good looks like. I can hire the right people, make this happen. And SDR and demand are so tightly interwoven mm -hmm. that it wasn't a huge leap. Where the huge leap for me has come is on the content side, the brand side, the product marketing side. And that's where I definitely need uh, smarter people than me around me. Totally. No, it's, it's interesting when you think about it, right? Um, what's the hardest thing in the business and sales to do is how do you differentiate yourself through an email or through a LinkedIn note or a call um, where someone might not want to talk to you? And I think, you know, you really probably refine that craft of messaging and positioning and differentiation, which is at the core of any job when it comes to marketing. So it makes a, makes a ton of sense to me. 100% and double clicking on that too, Ross. I was talking to the CEO of Chili Piper, uh, Alina, who's super sharp and is a, a, a marketer in her own right. And she made a really good point that the goal of marketing, the goal of SDR, the goal of outright, just like marketing in general is A, to get somebody's attention and B, to compel them to take action. Yes. And for whatever reason, marketing people seem to lose sight of both of those things. And they get so introspective and they get so ivory tower about their messaging, they end up doing neither. You're not getting anybody's attention. And even if you did, you're not compelling them to take action because your messaging is so fluffy. It's so verbose. It doesn't make, really make any sense. So I wouldn't trade my SDR upbringing for the world mm -hmm. with respect to how it informs my approach to marketing now, because exactly what you said, I'd like you can't get away uh, running an SDR team. If your messaging sucks, you can't do it. You have to find ways to A, get people's attention, B, compel them to take action. You have to speak in plain language. You have to really understand accounts, contacts, personas, all the rest. And you have to understand your value prop in a way, way beyond the headline on a website. You have to understand it in a way that actually compels people to want to learn more. And I, I think a lot of marketing people, because they don't have the front line, like getting yeah. yelled at experience, 
of, of prospecting or of sales, they kind of lose that and they get a little bit, like I said, too ivory tower in the way they present their solution. And it does their entire company a disservice. Yeah, nothing's real until it's in the field with uh, prospects and customers and people that are actually willing to spend money. So I, I, I totally agree with you there. And I think actually, the, the I, whole, it's funny. Yeah. I have a story about this, Ross, because I, yeah. I recently started taking my own deals just to kind of see if if uh, I was passing my own my own test on this. And prior to the week before I started taking my own deals, running my own demos, I had a, a polite conversation, uh, disagreement with one of our AEs who we were looking at a new pitch deck that I uh, put out there and was trying to do a certification on. And this mm -hmm. AE was like, we need to get these two slides. These two slides are no good. And I was like, no, they're great. And here's why, blah, 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 blah. And I got defensive and I got angry and I overruled him because of seniority. And then the week later, I presented those slides and yeah. I watched the people's eyes glaze over on the call. And I went back to this guy and I was like, so uh, those slides are out of the pitch deck now. <laughs> totally. Yeah, it's, it's always a balancing act, right? Um, you do need that consistency. You do need to kind of, you know, get in line and, and kind of tell the same story from top of funnel all the way down, which is important. But at the same time, it needs to resonate, you know, and that's the core of it. So uh, making sure you're, you're getting both is, is, is hard. And uh, like you said, the best folks actually get down into the reality, which is on the field with prospects and with customers and get said no to or get said yes to. And, and that's the truth. That's right. In, in business, right. That's right. Awesome. Well, shifting gears, um, we're going to talk about deal execution excellence. And we picked kind of three topics to dig into today, two very similar, which I love both of them. We're gonna talk about account points of view, contact points of view, and value prop alignment to strategic initiatives. Yeah. Um, or as I like to say, uh, being a small part of a big problem. Um, so yeah, which, which order do you think we should hit this in, Kyle? Let's talk about accounts first. I think it's probably the right place to start. Awesome, awesome. So. You know, if you had three things to pick coming into this conversation, uh, this is number one. Why is this the most important thing when you think about what leads to execution excellence in the field? The, the reason that many go-to-market teams struggle is because they don't have time or don't take the time to actually understand the accounts that they're selling into, or maybe frame differently. They don't have the time or take the time to understand the, the reasons that they win deals and then do the pattern matching that informs their account-based strategies. And what I mean by that, Ross, is people are like, oh, we sell to cybersecurity companies. And so we're just gonna go target cybersecurity companies and like it's a shoulder shrug as to why we win mm -hmm. these deals. What you have to do is you have to go and dig under the, the, the hood a little bit here to understand why do we sell so well to this industry or this vertical or this company size or this segment or something like that. And often what you find, if you do the work, is there are our commonalities that have less to do with the industry they're in or um, the, the company size or something like that. And it has mm -hmm. way more to do with what are the strategic initiatives of those companies and how do you support those initiatives? Because what do executives care about? They care about the initiatives that they are trying to pursue. And mm -hmm. that, especially now in 2024, you're not gonna get uh, your deal funded unless the executives are bought in. And so, okay, we have a foothold in cybersecurity. Well, what do a lot of cybersecurity companies have in common? Many of them, especially in 2020 to 2022, on a path to IPO. Interesting. So now we don't have a value prop that makes a lot of sense for a cybersecurity company. We have a value prop that makes a lot of sense for companies that are on a path to IPO. Mm, totally yeah. different framing there. And if you have that and you can do that pattern matching and you can say, we help companies that are rolling out a new product line or are um, introducing a new business model that's SaaS based. They used to be on-prem, now they're SaaS or like whatever those strategic initiatives are, international expansion, M&A, like there's something happening at the executive strategic level. And if you can attach to that and do that in a way over and over and over again, because these things are like, like I said, pattern matching, the same things exist and most companies. And if you can find those set of five or 10 things to truly sell against, that's what having a real POV on an account is. That's what's going to create for compelling messaging. That's what's going to allow for really unified account-based marketing and outbound and discovery and demos and all the rest. And again, like that's what's going to make your business case land. So it's hard to do. It takes time to do. It's a double or triple click into companies and their rationales or reasons for being that most teams do not do. If you do that, you will stand out. Totally. Yeah. So it's about getting the, the layer deeper. Okay. Yes. It's this industry is vertical or company size. that's really resonating 
why and how has that changed? I think that's like, you know, talking about product market fit and companies discovering it or losing it in recent years. I think that's, you know, a great point where, hey, maybe we're selling to these companies because of this reason. And that reason changed to the executives and you need to kind of exactly. realign around that. Exactly. And I'll, I'll give you an example. And this is a higher level example. It, it probably needs to be a little bit more detailed, Ross, but what, what am I currently at Copy AI? What am I selling against? I'm not selling against, you know, AI workflow automation. And here's the way that you can increase productivity for a certain subset of your teams. Like that's small potatoes and a CRO, CMO, CFO, CEO, probably not going to care about that. Mm -hmm. What I am going to sell them is this opportunity to fundamentally change the financial profile of their business by changing, flipping the script entirely on their customer acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. We're going to increase the span of control of your SDRs from supporting one AE to supporting four AEs. What's that going to do for your business? That is a totally different type of conversation than anything that has to do with AI. Yep. And interestingly, when I'm talking to CEOs- It's about the why, not the how, right? right? We're not getting into just the how, okay, how we do it. It's why are you doing this thing? Yeah. Exactly. And that's the type of thing that compels them to take action. And so now I have CROs that are reaching out to me, checking in on how the deal is going because they're so interested in like being a hero to their board of directors because this is their mandate. Their mandate is to create a go-to-market operation that is totally bloat-free and super high velocity. And the only way that you can do that is by having transformational value from the AI solution that you're, that you're evaluating. And so that's what we're attaching to. And that's what we're selling against. And of course, when we're selling to, you know, a manager, individual contributor level person, we're talking more about the how, but when we're at mm -hmm. the executive level, we're talking way more about the why, and we're very, very high level about the how. And so that it requires a different type of process. It requires a different type of thought process from your team and unification across your go-to-market engine so that there really is consistency in the touch points that you have with all the different members of the buying group. Totally. And I'm gonna maybe we're gonna shift gears a bit here um, outside of the normal scheduling program because I think this is a truism. Like what you're talking about is true for every business, and I think the companies that I'm seeing are winning today are getting down to that next level why and are able to elevate their messaging and positioning to something that's stupid simple so that everyone from you know from your website or you know outbound marketing whatever it is down to customer success is able to tell that story and have that conversation at that executive level. But you could be successful for a very long time before, let's call it 2023, without having to do that. Yeah, and I'm seeing that a lot of people don't have this skill in-house of figuring out all of the things that you're talking about. I'm curious to get your take on, yeah, what you're seeing in the market and you know, roughly what percentage of companies or executive teams are even able to do what you're describing because I'm seeing a lot of people still stuck in that old world of, Reps were hitting quota, leaders were able to, you know, be successful and grow revenue with talking a lot about uniquely how we do the thing, yeah. not figuring out uniquely why is an executive or team didn't even spend time with us yeah. when focus is the name of the game now. So yeah, curious to kind of get your take on that kind of huge shift. It's a huge shift. And a lot of companies, especially tech companies, fall for the trap of thinking that the best product wins. And it's just not true. I mean, Salesforce is the most popular CRM on the planet. And I don't know anybody that loves Salesforce. <laughs> and there are great, some other great CRMs out there. And I guess HubSpot's on the come up, but like that's, that's example number one. Best product does not always win. And so a lot of companies expect, and we're proven right in the you know go-go days of 2015 to 2022, that the people could fund all sorts of products and bring on a bunch of different products that had a little bit of overlap and their people, companies were okay with that because it was growth at all costs and people weren't paying as much attention to operational efficiency. Not the case anymore. Not the case. The best product is not going to win. People do not have unlimited budget to bring on all these SaaS tools. They do not entertain any sort of overlap between the tools that they do have. And you need to show up as different. You need to have that compelling messaging that is going to uh, make that difference uh, and change the, the way that make a difference in the way that the executives are thinking, change their thinking, mm -hmm. direct them toward a new and different future. And it's hard. It's really hard to do. It's a muscle that a lot of companies are going to need to build because they, frankly, like you said, they haven't had to do it before. Yeah. Even as a seller, I mean, I think back to how I was successful as a seller, I was more differentiating my products as the how it solved the problem. And I was talking to the folks that got it right below the C-suite level, even sometimes below the, the VP level that were able to unlock budget and make these decisions. Now it's you need to differentiate on the why 
Like, are you going to invest in this problem set or this problem set? Because you can only do so much. And before it was, how do we differentiate on, hey, we're better than this product in this way. It's, hey, we're probably going to cut spend here and not even reinvest in it. We're not going to move it back. Like our goal right. is to cut 20, 25%. If you're coming in with a new product in the market, a new category, you're creating budget, not taking it away. So you better be absolutely nailing what you're saying is, where's the company focused on um, at the board level? Exactly. That's exactly right. And it's a, it's a much different conversation to have. And a lot of people will, will bristle at this a little bit, Ross, and they'll say, oh, well, this is going to slow my deal cycles down. No, wrong. If you do this well and you get executive buy-in, you create deal velocity because you are talking to the people, the power brokers that can actually get something done. And it's amazing how a little bit of a like, CEO tailwind can eliminate blockers in yes. such of a company. And this is this is the perfect transition from the account level, right? We're talking about figuring out the company's whys and that pattern matching, all this stuff to contact level points of view. So yep. why is that number two on your list of the most important things for nailing uh, execution on the field? Sure. So let's, let's kind of recap. What did we learn about the account? We learned about the strategic initiatives that that account is pursuing. Okay, great. Now, when I'm doing contact research, I'm not trying to understand like if they own a parrot or foster huskies or something like that. That's not what like personalization is. Maybe interesting. I throw that in the PS line of a yeah, exactly. or whatever, but no, that's not what's going to compel people to take action here. What's going to compel them to take action is if you understand what their individual role is in pursuing the strategic initiative of the company. That's how you connect the dots here. So if you know that this company is gearing up for an IPO, or you know that this company is expanding internationally or rolling out a new product line or going through an M&A or whatever it is, and these are all go-to-market examples, the same set of examples exist on the technical side, I'm just less familiar with them. Then you need to understand what is the CRO's role in this? What is the CMO's role in this? How are the regional directors, VPs, whatever, how are they impacted by this? And then sell to those things. Mm -hmm. And show them in, in your cold outreach, in your discovery, in your demos, that you understand that this is a major initiative for the business and that you're going to help put the superhero cape on them so that they deliver on this strategic initiative and they become the hero inside their own company with their board. That's fundamentally, it's human nature here. Like people want to look good. They want to make a difference. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, I like to think about making your champions champions, right? Is how do you get them that promotion? How do you make them look good in front of someone? And the only way that you're ever going to get your conversation to the rest of the company is if, if you said you impress them with the fact that you understand, you know, a lot of us, you know, especially A's that might be listening out there or, you know, even frontline managers aren't even close to the level of expertise and understanding that a C-suite or, you know, an SVP might be having that you're talking to, but you should have the conviction that, you know, this little lane that you're focused on, right? We solve this problem for these companies in this way. You're going to know far more than that. And having that confidence and conviction there. I think really helps in what you're talking about, which is how are you going to look good for the people that they're going to introduce you to? Exactly. And you need to help arm your team with those things. You can't expect everyone to be that A-plus player that's going to go out and do the research, right? You see everyone talking on LinkedIn, hey, just do this stuff. Your team, your whole team is never going to do that. I'm sorry. How do you, like you're saying, help your field understand at the contact level what right. these people care about, what the slides are that's going to be different from talking to, you know, an IC versus a manager versus a director versus a P VP are going to be completely different words. Yes. And you need to make sure that you're doing the work, not expecting your team just to, to figure that out because it's, it's never going to happen. It's such a good point. Like, and God, like I've led enablement teams. I know you've worked with however many salespeople over the years. God bless them. Enablement is the heart. Like they just don't care. They've got a million other things to do and trying to train people on how to do exactly that is really, really hard. So until it's something that matters to your VP of sales or your CRO, it's probably not going to change behavior across the field. And so yeah. hopefully your VP of sales or CRO agrees with this mindset and can help with the language translation that needs to happen to do exactly what you just said. I see manager, director, VP, C-level, all like shades and gradients of difference. So that when you look at this whole messaging map, the value prop to an IC is totally 100% different than the value prop to a C-level person. And so like your exec team needs to lean in and needs to make it a priority to figure this out and then needs to make it a mandate for your sellers to get on board and understand the rationale. Totally. Yeah. If, uh, if you can't do it yourself uh, and nail that as a leader at a company, good luck having that new rep that you're you know paying a lot of money to ramp and the frontline manager over them and all this other stuff and their benefits, good luck for them to be able to figure that thing out. 
Yeah. So. It's, it's funny, Russ. Cause I, I hear from like senior level sell- sellers, VPs of sales and CROs, and they come like griping about their team. Like, Oh, I always have to be this super rep. I have to be the one who goes into these deals and, and talks to the executives. I'm like, well, are you training them on how you think? Are you training them on like what, what these conversations are? How you're framing? The it's not rocket science. It's not that not you're so much science. smarter. It's that you've just done the thing. You're in those shoes. Yeah. You have the context. Exactly. Yeah. You have the context to be able to have a different level of conversation. It's not impossible to help sellers understand this. You just have to actually care about enablement. And most senior level salespeople do not care about enablement. And it's a, such a shame. Yeah, totally. And I think part of the problem is, um, at least my experience, uh, on that side of the house is very, it feels very theoretical. Like they're not using, it's funny because it's almost, you know, ironic that they're not using the right words to speak to sales leadership around the why that they need to train here, right? It's kind of like, they're using all these crazy conceptual and very like, you know, cerebral frameworks to talk about why they need to do it versus like, exact. hey, you need your reps to hit quota to make your capacity number for the year and look good in front of the board versus like, you know, Caldini's framework of the seven influential things involved. I'm like, that's not the language that you need to be using for your buyer here, uh, which is right. the whole problem that we're trying to solve for anyway. Yeah, that's very well said. And hey, I'm a psychology major in college. I'm a big fan of Robert Cialdini. Like, great guy, great guy. But yeah, you're totally right. Like, it's got to be brass tacks. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, well, before we wrap up the contact point of view piece, any other things to, to share. Yeah, there. So one other important thing that I've been actually spending a lot of time thinking about here, Ross, because it, I realized it was something that I do naturally and then trained my teams to do over the years, but it's kind of a foreign concept to a lot of teams, which was surprising to me, which is when you're researching somebody, a lot of teams look at what's their current role. Okay. My work here is done. Mm. No. So go back to, to how we started this conversation. I became a CMO up through SDR and demand generation. When you are pitching me, you damn well better focus on the pipeline elements of your yes. product. Very different than a CMO who came up through content marketing or product marketing, different focus area. So when you're doing your contact research, understanding somebody's work history yes. and making some inferences about what their specialty or focus areas or areas of expertise are based on their current role, of course, but also what they've done in the past is really, really important. And it's that kind of just little shade of difference, 10 or 20% difference in your value prop that is actually hyper relevant. That creates the relevance. That's what makes sure that your message will resonate. And so I, I just wanted to pepper that in because it's really important. And a lot of teams just like completely skip that. I think that's something that, you know, just flipped the switch in my mind because it's something that I feel like I was unconsciously aware yeah. that I was doing and something that I haven't really been training my team on. And, you know, for example, we think about a CRO. Did they come from the sales deal execution side or do they come from more of the operations oh, side? And the conversation really- you're going to have with a strategy ops type C level is going to be very different than a, than someone that came up from an IC and was very good at their craft. Both can be great at their job, but the conversation you're going to have with each of those types of person, the, the, you know, the business school type executive versus the person that came up in the craft 100%. is going to be a completely different conversation. And if you can come in, just like you said, making those small tweaks, if you're going to go from not resonating at all with what you're talking about to absolutely nailing it. Totally right. And this is such a good example too, because there are two different profiles of chief revenue officer. You have the super rep who's been a rep their whole life, and you have the operations person who came up through ops. And Mm -hmm. if you're talking about the science of selling to the super rep CRO, no way, in one ear, not the other. You got to focus on the art. You got to focus on what makes the salesperson tick. Like that's what you got to focus on. And then completely opposite for the other operational CRO, science. This is a spreadsheet problem. We can go solve it together. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, we're, we're, we're speaking the same language here. I'm glad that you shared that. Cause again, I think it's something that the best people do, but maybe unconsciously. And you know, how do you drive consistent, great execution is through unwinding the things that the best people are doing and making it obvious and train the rest of the team on. So I love that. Yep. Yep. Um, the last piece that kind of fits into both, I think really well is this overall value prop alignment with strategic initiatives, right? So this yeah. is now just moving away from Overall, what's happening in our accounts, what's happening in context, tying it to the unique value prop of how we do the thing and why we exist. Love to hear yeah. your take on this. So we talked already about like the pattern matching that you can do and the real reason that you're winning customers and all of that. So now when we're talking about value prop alignment, I want to talk about it through the lens of consistent buyer experience, Ross. How often does it happen that the account-based marketing team serves some value prop and then the lead converts? And then the lead talks to the SDR about something completely different than what was on the landing page. 
Yeah. And then for some reason they take a meeting and then the AE talks to them about something completely different than the SDR did or the ABM <laughs> landing page said. And it's like, what are you idiots doing? Like you have to be work really hard to ensure that. Let's just keep using the example of IPO preparation. If that's the value prop that you're leading with, you're serving digital ads, you're doing account-based marketing, you have nurture emails, you have outbound emails, that damn well better be what you talk to them about in an yeah. initial call with an SDR or an AE. That should be the way you frame the demo. That should be the way that you frame your, your entire deal. And so make sure that there is complete alignment in all the different touch points that you have because that consistency of the buyer experience is very hard to execute and makes a huge difference. Like that's what separates the great go-to-market teams from the bad ones is that level of consistency. Totally. And this is, um, I always thought about when I was in IC, my job was to, at my point in the journey, right? I, well, when I was in that seat, I thought it was the only point in the journey, right? I never thought about really like top of funnel and brand and how they thought about us and their yeah. you know, positioning there. It was like, no, I'm talking to them. That's the start of the journey. And when I close them and onward them, that's the end of the journey. But yes, what you're bringing up is this whole kind of, you know, experience beyond just the sales process or just, you know, the marketing funnel and thinking about what problem did they initially think that you're solving from the way that you're framing up, you know, the, the copy on a billboard, the, you know, the three words that you're using, how does that change to when an SDR reaches out? How does that change when you have that first discovery call all the way through? I think when, you know, if you came up from being an IC, then a manager director, you think about your world in a small pocket of that. Right. And I think it takes really great executives to kind of step back and do the work and to yeah. spend the quarters and to get really close to the customers to understand what's that through line. What's the thing that's going to actually, like you said, drive action and attention on every one of those conversations. And it's really freaking hard to do. Yeah. It's really hard to say the same thing on the billboard as it is when you're onboarding someone post sales and that's going to get them just as excited. And, but that's like you said, the job of great companies is to figure that out. Exactly. Use the exact right word, Ross, which is the through line there should be a direct through line that you can trace back. And like we said before, yes, the value prop is going to change for different levels of seniority and all the rest. But like the, the message that you're sending to the executive needs to remain the same from the time they learn about your company to the time you're implementing and then the value journey you take them on until you help them realize that first strategic initiative. And then you've earned the right to say, what's next? Let's go take that down together. So it, it's cool when you can do that. And it makes, that's what being a true like consultative sales person or sales team really is it's hard to do but when you do it right it pays massive dividends yeah and i can see how you've done that a copy even from this conversation talking about you know the go-to-market flow and the strategic initiatives and how you tie that down to the different levels of the doers versus you know the decision makers and um you know it's what lenny our our uh, you know head of uh, marketing who joined us was like hey the first thing i'm gonna do is like we got to all say the same thing. I'm looking at these emails. Yes, you're talking about great problems with your customers and you're doing great consultative selling, but it's not the thing that we're consistently saying from our marketing messaging all the way through product and CS. And I think it's it's a big commitment, right? And we kind of took this on. It took months and months and months to get it wrong and wrong and wrong until you get it right. <laughs> and then you kind of have that aha moment and you're like, holy shit, this yeah. is working. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's it's required to have an efficient Theme, or else you're kind of really confusing your market and your and your uh, and your frontline folks. Hundred percent. Awesome. Well, before we move off that, any any uh, takeaways or learnings that you've had, or maybe uh, you know challenges that you could share with the team around trying to build that, right? Like you just you know more recently joined Copy AI and went through that experience. What's a a tip or a trick you'd give to um, revenue teams around how do you figure out that through line? Um, some some shortcuts maybe. Yeah, the, there's no shortcut. I mean, it, it takes work. Like any any good outcome requires work, Roz. You know this. Yeah. The 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 um the advice is go talk to customers. And when you're talking to customers, ask them why did you buy, and then ask them again. So what? So what? So what? Five times, like you're a five year old. And then with a and of course you need to be at the executive level when you're having this conversation. And then you'll find, oh, that's what you're trying to do. I just heard the same thing from this other company. And then you're going to start to do the pattern matching in your head. And then you'll find the three or five or 10 real reasons that people buy your, your product. And that's the launch pad that you need. So customer interviews, I, that was my first uh, 60 days here. I talked to like uh, one or two customers per day. And it was for that exact reason. So that's like really helped crystallize things in my mind. Oh, yeah. Great tip. Uh, there's no better investment in your time as a leader at a company than talking to customers or prospects. And I think the 
aha moment for me is when I was talking to Mark Whalen of Box CRO there and a legendary executive at Salesforce. And he says he spends over 30, a third of his time still as a CRO wow. of his company in front of not, not forecast meetings, not pipeline reviews, not QBRs with the reps, but in front of customers, because that is where the truth is. And how are you going to help lead a team when you don't deeply understand the truth? And this was a big frustration of me being at other companies before is I felt like I knew our customers and knew the right answers more than the leadership team, because I, as a seller, I lived with the customer. I knew the truth. And I think there can be a lot of frustration sometimes from the field yeah. to leadership when they are not in front of customers a lot of the time, a significant portion of the calendar. And I think this is something that Jason Lemkin talks a lot about and he's learned yeah. from being a startup leader. And every time I see that, I'm just like, oh, I can't believe I went through months and quarters on strategy, on hiring, and all this stuff. You don't know what's right until you're out there in the field. So it's a great yeah. reminder, Kyle. It's really well said. Cool, man. Well, thanks so much for taking the time. This was awesome. Honestly, I have things to go back to my team with, and I hope that's exactly what folks listening into this conversation, that's why we do this, is so you're just like, oh, this is you know a great reminder of something that we probably all know we should be doing um, to make sure we're just putting in that work and you know trying to figure out how to fit the, the time in to, to do all these tough things, right? That's right. That's right. You got to find the time. You got to make the time. This, is, this stuff does not happen by accident. So thanks for having me, Ross. This has been awesome. Of course. Thanks again. Talk soon.